Hey friends, I'm Daniel Nesbitt, and welcome to a new series on the channel. I'm really excited to share this one with you because for the first time, we're not going to be creating an original typeface. We're actually going to be working on a revival typeface. This is something new to the channel, but certainly not new to the industry of type design. Um, and after spending a year in the Type West program through the Letterform Archive in 2022, uh, I've really learned a lot about how uh, creating revival typefaces can actually be a really good educational tool in terms of learning how typefaces work, how they're designed, how they're constructed, spaced, the whole nine yards. So the typeface that I'm working on for this series is a typeface called Ludlow Record Gothic. And I know there are a couple um, revivals out there already of this or variations um, of sorts. But I found a catalog of the typeface, uh, and through a little bit of, of luck through some eBang, uh, I was able to secure that. So, after making some scans and really kind of studying this on my desk for the last year or so, I wanted to jump in and start creating a new series on this. So I've done a couple things ahead of hitting record here, and I'm just going to jump through that really quickly. Uh, the big thing you'll notice on the screen is that we've got a couple characters here, and really all I did was went through and scanned in all of the letter forms. Now I'm fortunate in this case because I have a specimen that I actually get all of the characters, or at least all the characters that I'm aware of, that were originally created with the typeface. If you do decide to follow along in this series and maybe you want to choose a different typeface, note that sometimes this can be a challenge, and it certainly was when I was in TypeWest, uh, and I originally found a typeface for that. Um, sometimes you don't get the whole picture. So uh, one of the reasons that I was really excited about this one is that we've got the full alphabet. We've even got some additional characters too, you'll note in yellow here. And these were actually, uh, as far as I can tell, sold separately from the base font that you see on the screen here. Uh, now, one thing I will note is we will get into some things like diacritical marks, and you'll notice that those aren't in here. Uh, but I do feel that I have enough information on the screen uh, scanned in here that we can kind of make some reasonable assumptions about what something might look like if it had a diacritical mark on there. Uh, additionally, for characters on a modern keyboard that we don't see here, for example, uh, perhaps like the at symbol, I think is one of them. Uh, we're going to go ahead and, in the same vein, just give our best guess or best uh, estimation of what that may have looked like. So there will be some liberties taken, but for the most part, we kind of have the core alphabet here. In addition to scanning in the regular weight, I also do have additional weights. We have an extended version of this typeface, and then there are things like uh, bold and italic versions of this as well. For the sake of getting started here, we're just going to focus on the regular weight, but I just wanted to make note that I'm also thinking ahead to how other weights and other sizes of this typeface are going to interact with this one. So that's just worth keeping in mind, but for now, we're just going to stick with one weight. And then the last thing that I went ahead and did here uh, was using the capital H and the lowercase n, and I, prob I promise this mess makes sense in a second here. Um, but I actually went through and kind of measured out what the cap height and the x height uh, of this typeface were. So I went ahead and made those updates in the masters uh, under font info here. And for now I'm just focusing on the cap height and the x height. When we get to things like the ascender and descender, we can kind of take a look and figure out where we need to go. But kind of looking at the typeface here, you know, like the ascender for example, if we look kind of how this h overlaps the d to the side here, I don't think there's going to be too much difference in scale uh, for those, so I don't think that's going to uh, greatly uh, disturb kind of these baseline settings. Beyond that, everything else is pretty much default in lifts here. Um, the only other thing that I'm going to do real quick is uh, just adjust some things here with my keyboard increments. Um, these are just personal preferences. You can leave these as default, but oftentimes I feel that if I'm uh, doing an increment, typically five is kind of my go-to uh, command for uh, moving things 20 units over if I'm using my arrow keys, um, because I just feel that 100 is oftentimes too much. So those are the settings, and uh, these are the scans. So I've, I've got these uh, imported in here. And beyond uh, trivial things like getting this scaled up to size and whatnot, 
uh, which of course depends on on your scans and what size they are, what resolution they are. Uh, we're pretty much ready to go here. So, with all of that out of the way, let's get to designing a font for the first time in some time. Uh, so, for those who have followed in previous series, you'll know that we're going to be focusing on control characters to start. Uh, in this case, that is the capital O, the capital H, the lowercase n that I've got on the screen here, and then the lowercase o next to it. My preference is to start with the lowercase n. Um, of course, other people kind of have other uh, preferences, but this is usually the route that I go. And full disclosure, I did kind of do a practice run on this one ahead of hitting records, so I've got kind of a, a decent idea of what I'm uh, looking for here in terms of measurements and positioning and kind of where my points are going to go. Uh, so if you notice me kind of putting points down with, with a bit of, uh, um, what do we want to call this, like optimism, <laughs> you'll know why. I practiced beforehand. So, with all of that out of the way, the first thing we did here was we just kind of laid down a stem. Now, originally, when I was going through this and kind of working this out, I've determined that 65 units across was, was a pretty good width for me. Uh, one thing I'm going to get in the habit of right away is just using my dimensions panel in the upper corner because at some point I absolutely will forget some of these measurements, especially as we come back to this over time. Um, so, in the comment section, if you don't see me filling this out, um, feel free to shout. So with that out of the way, we can kind of get to the, uh, the more exciting part of this here, which is the rest of the N. And so really all I'm doing here is I'm just focusing on making straight lines. I'm not worried about curves quite yet. And if you're kind of curious what I'm doing here, one of the reasons that I kind of like scans, especially when you can see pixels, is it gives you a good idea of where the apex of a curve might be. So in this case, I'm just taking these two points here, and since we're in straight line mode, we're not worried about handles or anything else like that. Uh, and I'm just doing my best to kind of figure out rough where the center or the apex of these two curves are. Uh, the other thing that I'm gonna go ahead and do is take these two points on the side here, and just try and move them up to a spot where I think the curve starts. Um, and while I'm also doing this, I'm also keeping in mind what my my weight is through here. Um, it's not exactly perfect, and as we go here, we'll uh, we'll kind of smooth this out a little bit more. But I want to just kind of give myself a good starting spot here. Um, so you know everything kind of looks pretty good. The other thing I'm keeping in mind as we get to this other curve here is that this is going to taper off a little bit. Now the tough part about this curve, as it kind of curves down into the vertical stem. I don't really have a good uh, bearing right now on where these two points off to the side here are going to terminate. So again, just kind of doing my best guess, loosely keeping uh, this stroke here as, as kind of um, even in weight as possible, but also kind of tapering a little bit as we get towards the stem too. Um, but as we go here, we'll, we'll continue to refine these. So. With that out of the way, we'll go and hit the Option key and click on these lines here. And let's get those curve, those Bezier curve handles going. Um, I'm just going to focus on one half of this for now. And all we're going to do is take these curves and just try and match the curve of my scan here. Now, rather than uh, grabbing each one of these handles and doing uh, each curve or each handle separately. I'm just holding down the Option key and clicking roughly in the middle of the curve here. This is kind of a preference uh, that I've, I've grown to have after uh, you know, designing a number of, of typefaces in class. Um, you can certainly do it the other way too, but uh, I've just kind of found that that works for me. So all we're going to do here is uh, we're going to kind of move these around a little bit. And I'm also kind of looking at the weight of this here too as it compares to down here. Uh, the last thing we want is for this to thicken up as we go, which I think it kind of is. Um, so I'm also keeping that in mind. The other thing that I'm looking at is that these two handles here are approximately uh, kind of like at a 45 degree angle to each other as well. Uh, so basically what that means is that, that each node or each Bezier curve here is kind of taking um, an equal share of, of the curve, so to speak. 
Um, and all this is doing is just helping us create a smooth, consistent curve, or setting us up maybe to create a smooth, consistent curve. So with that out of the way, we'll go and we'll grab the other side. And for this one, rather than using the option trick, I'm actually going to select both handles here. Because one thing that I like to do for this is keep these two handles kind of in relation to each other so that the curve, as it goes all the way around, continues to be smooth. Um, I found that's that's usually the best way to go because oftentimes I get lumpy, um, you know, kind of uh, shapes through here. So anytime that I'm kind of messing around with, uh, with, with handles or with curves here in this situation, um, we're just we're trying to keep things as related as relational to each other i guess if that's a phrase as much as we can um so with that out of the way we've, we've got kind of an initial letter form here um and immediately i'm already kind of seeing some issues here i, I still feel like this gets a bit thick here and you'll notice i'm just holding down my my space key here but as i kind of move my mouse around you'll see what i mean so we got a width of 65 it goes up to about 70 there before it starts to taper back down. So we'll want to fix that. Um, and so this for me is kind of where we start making some decisions about things. So I'm that back, it still goes up to 65. And so I just have to kind of decide here how do we want to resolve this a little bit. So. Just gonna kind of do some things that looks fairly decent. Um, one thing I will do: you may notice some uh, some things here that that pop up from time to time. I'll just kind of point this out real quick. Um, occasionally, you might see um, you know things like red arrows, for example. I do have some additional plugins installed from the base version of Glyphs. I will do my best to share these in the description. Um, but if I don't, feel free to ask in the comment section. Um, offhand, I believe some of these may be paid, but I try and get most of them uh, through the plugin manager for free in the uh, in Glyphs here. So just worth keeping in mind. Um, so with that out of the way, I'm going to uh, actually grab one of my first plugins here. It's a show heat map. And I actually kind of like this because it just kind of helps me determine where we're at. Uh, but basically all this is doing is it shows a heat map of my stem thickness here. And as you can see, it, it kind of, uh, we kind of have this tapering around nicely. So you see this, this red, um, this red part of the heat map here, but you'll see that it doesn't really thicken up. It just kind of keeps a similar color until it tapers and fades out and then goes into the vertical stems. So. That is good to see there. I'm very happy with that. We're going to go through and turn heat map off. Um, and then the other thing that I'm just going to kind of take a look at here is my curves. And I do kind of play with these just a little bit, but basically I'm just looking for something that's kind of smooth around here. Um, and again, I might kind of play with this a little bit. Um, Go back five there. And again, this is just, there's a lot of back and forth at this stage. You know, do we do we have things where we want them? Um, and truth be told, I might continue to come back and look at this again and again. Um, I don't think that's too bad. It's a plugin. Let's get the right direction here with my zoom. There is a plugin I don't have installed, which I probably should for the next episode, called Super Tool, um, which is actually kind of great because you can go through and you can kind of get a uh, uh, an idea, technically speaking, of um, of your curves. It gives you some additional tools. Uh, I don't have that, unfortunately. Um,
But I think all that's to say, um, if I just kind of stand back, and I'm also kind of taking a look down here as well in my my preview window, I, I would say that's a pretty serviceable end. Um, and we can kind of get rid of all of our our pieces underneath there, uh, our, our image. So yeah, and it is kind of a goofy shape too. Um, so typically I'm used to kind of more of a gentle curve where this one kind of stabs into the uh, into the vertical stem here a little bit. Um, one thing I can't really tell, and I don't know if this is really necessary, but th that might taper over a little bit. Um, again, this is just kind of more of a preference that I do when I'm designing my own fonts. Um, that might not actually be what they did here, but... We can kind of play around with it. If if something like that does exist, I think it's it's pretty subtle. Um, I definitely get the impression that this was probably uh, designed by Ludlow to counter something like a um, Accidents Grotesque or a Franklin Gothic, uh, maybe something in that neighborhood. One interesting thing about type history is the number of uh, type design studios that would see a competitor release uh, of, of what would end up being a popular typeface and, and how quick many of them would be to kind of rush and, and kind of do their own variant or version of it uh, to kind of cash in on the trend at the time. Um, something that made me smile because it's, it's something you still see to this day uh, in the digital age, so kind of fun to think that, that the people who were designing type before us were kind of falling into the same trap that we do today. So. Uh, with that out of the way, one last thing I'm going to do here is start to figure out my side bearings. Now for the side bearings, um, because I have a specimen, again, I can refer to this, um, and I'm of course doing this off screen, but uh, what I might do here is actually just kind of pop up a preview of the page that I'm looking at. Um, but typically when I'm looking through a specimen, um, one of the great things is they often include uh, some sample copy or sample layouts. So all I'm going to do is kind of take a look at that and maybe just kind of give myself a best guess of what the spacing might be for this. Now to do that, uh, what we're going to do here is, uh, I won't do that, I'm just going to do 100 for a moment here, but I'm going to put a number of ends on the screen. Um, and one other thing that I'm going to do, actually, while we're here, I'm just going to pop open the H real quick, the lowercase h. I'm going to copy this over to that, because I think I'm going to make that my next character. I'm sure you can figure out why the resemblance is a bit uncanny, but the benefit of this is that it, uh, it just gets us now to our lowercase n here. And then all I want to do is kind of go through and, and figure out roughly what I want for the spacing. Um, so for now, oops, I'm going to do some shortcuts here. So I'm just going to make it even on both sides. Um, and it does look like they did include a, a bit of space between the letters here. So what I'm looking at, which you can't probably see, is um, I have a lowercase u next to a lowercase n. The word is runs that I'm looking at. Uh, I'm primarily looking at the space the, between the two verticals, between the right vertical stem of the u and the left vertical stem of the n. Um, and I'm just trying to figure out what kind of spacing I want here. If I had a guess, it roughly looks about half. Um, maybe something like that. Actually, it could be a little bit more. Well, my hunch is... That's kind of my hunch, I think. Um... Maybe a little less. So this is kind of the back and forth we have here. Um, I 
And again, as I'm working more and more on this, I'll probably continue to go back and forth uh, and refine this a little bit. I'm going to go with this for now. So we've got 75 on the left and 70 units on the right. Um, what we'll also do is we'll go we'll copy, paste this into the H. Make sure that's locked. And we'll go ahead and pop that in. After the H, I don't need this taper anymore, so what we'll do is line those two up, delete that. Then we can take this and run that up to about there. So that'll be my ascender height. This does seem to have a tall X height, so um, we're keeping that in mind. So I'm going to make that 705 since that's a nice round number. So what we're going to do is we're going to go back to my masters before we get too far away from that. I'm going to type in 705 for the ascender there. Now one benefit of this is I have a 1000 unit M box that goes around this. And when we start getting into things like diacritical marks, the nice part about this setup here is that we will have plenty of space, probably, fingers crossed, at the top for uh, those diacritical marks. So, with that out of the way, we're going to go through and we're just going to have the H use these side bearings from the N, and already we've got a couple letters here. Now, there are trivial ones, uh, perhaps like the L. Which again, I'm not even going to move the image over for this one. But what we're going to do is just kind of copy and paste some of these here. Now for the eye, I will unlock the image and use that for this, but mostly because we want to do, uh, we want to kind of make that dot roughly the same size, so what we'll do here is get the lower stem into position, which looks fine, and we'll move this up. So one thing that I'm noticing already is that the dot of the eye seems to be a little bit larger. than the uh, the width of the stem here. So we'll go through, we'll do that. We're going to select everything and I'm just going to align these uh, over the top of each other. Kind of push that into place. I am debating how much bigger we want to make that. Um, And this is one of the things you kind of get trapped in with um, with designing uh, fonts because there is we have to think of this in two ways. Number one, how this printed on a page, and then number two, what the actual piece of type looked like. Uh, one thing that uh, folks who do a lot more type revivals than I do always consider is is how do they want the finished digital typeface to feel. Uh, if you're going off of the piece of type, you run into things potentially like ink traps, uh, particularly at smaller sizes, and maybe that's the style you're going for. Um, of course, on screen, we don't have to worry about ink spread uh, like designers back then used to. Uh, or on the flip side, you might take a look at a printed page like I am, where we would have ink spread. And it's usually just a tiny bit, but sometimes it can be noticeable at smaller point sizes. And then we have decisions to make. Do we want the typeface to have that feel as if it was pressed into a page and you kind of get that ink spread? Or do we want to go through and kind of clean it up a little bit? Um, in my case, I kind of split the difference, um, which, you know, for some people that's fine. For other people, uh, that that might uh, that might bother them a little bit more. Um, but that's kind of where I land on the matter. Uh, and who knows, maybe someday I might change my mind on that. But for now, um, all I'm doing is I'm kind of looking at the smaller preview here. I'm looking at the type specimen that I've got up in front of me. Um, and I'm just kind of, you know, jogging my eye back and forth and determining does what I see on the screen feel like what I'm seeing at the page. And I'm trying to keep things at, at roughly 
a comfortable reading distance. So I don't have my nose right up to my screen. I don't have my nose right up to the book here. Um, we're just kind of going back and forth as if I was reading this at a comfortable arm's length is kind of my barometer for this. Um, and I think we've kind of got that, that letter I in a good place, all that's to say. So with that out of the way, we'll go and we'll take that off of the I. We'll flip this over to the O. And now we're just going to kind of roughly position that about there. But the first thing I want to do before we get to that is start typing out some words. And um, I know we're not going to have many um, because I can only think of so many words that use a L-I-N-N -N, um, and an H. But I think I think this is kind of looking pretty good here. Um, seems to have a consistent feel, of course. Um, you know, we've basically used three shapes and we're repeating them, so there isn't a whole lot to critique here. Uh, again, with the N and the H, um, you know, negative space is going to be absolutely the same because they're more or less the same character with uh, just one stem that's a little bit taller than the other. Uh, of course, we don't really have to worry about the L and the I too much because kind of similar deal. There really isn't much negative space to either one of those. So, with that out of the way, let's jump over to the O. So now we get to introduce some fun into this. Um, and actually, before I do that, I'm going to go back. Uh, because I want to take a look at that. Which appears to be about 53. So let's, let's capture that too. The reason that I'm doing that is because if we dive down to the O here, so one thing we know about an O is that curves are traditionally slightly thicker than straight lines. And so if I know what my straight line weights are, we can kind of use that to figure out what a good weight on our O should be. So with that, I kind of noticed that felt off a little bit. I don't know if that's just kind of glyphs misbehaving or what, but let's try to draw that again. And just make sure that we're getting this nicely into the overshoot. There we go. And then we'll just kind of roughly get that width out to there. Now, I could go through and I could do like I did on the lowercase n and sit and move these out, uh, but personally, I enjoy using fit curve. And the reason that I like doing this is that I can, I can kind of dial this in a little bit, but then I've got something that I can reuse um, for other letters or other components as we move forward here. So um, I am going to try and get this dialed in just a touch. So I'm going to be adjusting these two curve values a little bit. Um, it might even be beneficial to go through and get this inner one done as well. So we potentially be going there. I want 70 units for the stem. Let's do about that. I'm going to select everything and just have glyphs go through and figure out my path directions for me automatic automatically. Um, doesn't look too bad. I think this inner one could be a little square. Let's see for a first pass, that isn't too bad. Now one other thing that I'm also thinking too here by the looks of it is this seems to to somewhat follow an expansion model. I think I see that a little bit more in the uppercase O down in the corner there. Um, so what's nice about that is I don't have to worry about uh, a diagonal stress in the letter or anything like that. The uh, the two thin parts here should pretty much be straight over the top of each other. So that's what we've got. And then of course going the other direction, uh, same story there too with the thicker strokes. They're also a few points heavier than the, uh, than the straight portions of the N, um, and that goes by about 
five, it looks like. To make this mathematically nice, I suppose I could go and make that five units the same way too. I don't think that's the end of the world to go like that. Um, but of course, the way we can really tell is by getting these two letters next to each other to figure out where we're at. So for the O, we're obviously going to want that spaced in a little bit closer. And for now, I'm just kind of loosely picking a number. I'm not really paying too much attention to that. Um, but what we'll do here is we'll kind of type out some nonsense words here. I always hope these are nonsense words when I'm typing them out. Um, and so basically what I'm looking at here is I'm looking at a couple things. I'm looking at the thickness of this stroke versus the thickness of the vertical strokes. And again, we're comparing that to how it looks in the, uh, the specimen here, the printed specimen. And then the other thing that I'm looking at is the thin strokes. So how does the one on the N compare to the one on the O? <clears throat> and, Im and immediately what I'm looking at here is that I might actually make that the thin stroke of that O a little bit thinner. Um, just so that it kind of matches the end a little bit more. Uh, the tough part with uh, Ludlow here is it looks like it's a fairly low contrast typeface too, so that certainly does add some challenges to it. Um, but what we'll do is uh, we're going to bring that down to 53 so it will match the end. But again, we're matching that on curves, so I don't think that's the end of the world. And then I don't want to make these um, these thick strokes super identical to each other. Actually, I may end up leaving that. Can I think of it? Perhaps taking some weight out of the top of the curve there was, was all it needed. So if I back up a little bit, it looks like these two curves are pretty well aligned. Um, so one of the, the tough parts I have is you know, I, d I don't think people notice one or two um, units when it comes to width or moving things around. Um, and who knows, maybe, maybe somebody with really good eyesight does, but um, it's something that I kind of go back and forth on a little bit because at a certain point, unless you're really looking at this with a critical eye, you might not even notice if I took five units out of something or two units out of something. Um, although I say that, and I think I did actually notice the five units out of this, so we'll kind of roll with that. Um, so, where are we at with the O? So it looks like 68 is going to be the magic number for that. And we'll stick with... 53 for the top of the curve there. Beautiful. All right, so we've got some lowercase letters. Um, I'm pretty happy with kind of how those are looking. We did kind of break a little bit away from the, um, the oh no character set, but, um, but I think that kind of helps. It helps us establish some context here and, and get an idea if the uh, the lowercase o and the lowercase n that we drew are um, are working with the rest of the font. The other thing that I'm kind of taking a look at is the negative space. So how much volume is inside the o versus the n? Uh, one of the things that's nice about doing a revival is that some of this stuff has already kind of been figured out for you. So you don't necessarily have to worry about that maybe as much as if you're designing your own typeface. And then of course. Um, it's kind of you versus your skill set uh, to figure out if you're in the right space or not. Um, but I'm pretty happy with that. So what we're going to do, uh, just to kind of wrap this episode up, is I'm going to jump over and I just want to tackle okay, the uppercase uh, O and H. And we can then call the control characters done. So what we're going to do is uh, I'm going to kind of figure out what this should be now. From my original notes, I landed at approximately 70 units wide, and I felt pretty good about that, so we'll go with that. 
So we don't want that to be a curve, we want that to continue being a straight line, so... Get into the duplicates there, there we go. Um, and what we'll do is we'll just rotate this around. This is why I love the case H, because you don't have to fuss with it very much. Um, and then we just need to figure out what the height of this thin stroke is going to be. Obviously 70 is a little bit too much. Um, I don't know if 60... Actually, 60 might not be too bad. It's kind of a 10 point, roughly a 10 point difference, and that's more or less in line with the lowercase. Uh, so again, I'm probably going to stick with that for the moment. What we'll do here. So I did uh, 75 units on the straight side of the N here. Uh, I think I'm actually going to bring this in to maybe 70 for now. And of course, these are nothing more than educated guesses as we start to develop more letters uh, in the alphabet here. Um, we'll kind of go through and figure out if these were good guesses or not. Um, but in the meantime, I think that will serve us all right. Actually, I might even go back and make it 75. So. And again, all we're kind of looking at is that negative space there. Eventually, I will be comparing this um, in uh, something like title case or uh, all uppercase. Um, but for now, with the control characters and just kind of a, a limited alphabet, um, just to kind of keep things moving, I think that'll work out. So what we'll do then is uh, pretty happy with that H. Of course, there really wasn't much to to worry about with that, but what we'll do is we'll go through and move our image over to the O. Um, and one thing I actually will point out here as I was moving this around, you, you will notice there is space between each of these letters. Um, I am not using this space for spacing. Um, a couple reasons for that. Number one, I do have uh, paragraphs of text and headlines of text that I can compare to, which is obviously spaced much closer than this. Um, I presume when they set this up in, in their layout, um, of course, you know, you're, you're kind of looking at the characters more than you are the words in this particular uh, part of the specimen page, so it kind of made more sense to kind of let each, each letter kind of breathe on its own so you could get an idea of what the typeface looked like. So I just wanted to make that note if anybody was curious as to why I wasn't um, really paying attention to that. Uh, one other thing that is worth noting is I didn't exactly scan this in straight. I did my best, but uh, with, a, with a cheap scanner that can be hard to do. So um, what I can do though, because I have an established uh, cap height baseline and then overshoots on either side, um, I'm going to kind of use that for the height of this. And then just use the metrics that I set in the program, or uh, sorry, the, the scan underneath for um, the width of the character. So we'll kind of use that as a starting point. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll go through, we'll use our fit curve tool, and then just kind of establish these guys here. So. Um, I'm thinking I should actually go back again, constant reminder, measurements. Um, so now unlike the lowercase n, um, these two units probably will be a different size. Um, and I think I'm going to start with a five unit difference between the two. We'll just go through and just put some rudimentary spacing on there for a moment. Um, but one thing that I'm kind of looking at here, the uppercase letters are going to be a little bit thicker than the lowercase letters, and uh, obviously the curves are going to be a little bit thicker than the straight lines here. So I'm kind of using five points to start, and what I've learned from the lowercase is that it was, what are we looking at, three points roughly of difference between the straight and the curved. Um, certainly could play around with that a little bit. 
But again, I'm comparing like the the weight of this crossbar, the visual weight, to the visual weight of this. Um, we start with that. And we bump that down to 62. Or maybe 63. So make sure that's even on both sides. I might actually do that as well for this. So instead of 75, let's see, 73 and 73 on each side. Again, I don't know how much people would notice or pay attention to this, but it makes me feel better if I have those values. Um, and it could argue too, actually, the 70 or the 60. Um, I could even consider bumping that up a little bit too. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, there was an eight unit difference if we were going to match the the lowercase exactly eight units of difference between the weight here and the weight in the vertical. Um, not that I think two units is going to do much either way, but yeah, I might just go back to 65 again. And and like I said earlier, this is a, a somewhat of a um, a low contrast typeface or a very low contrast typeface I should add. So. Um, I think I think that looks pretty good. And if I jump back into the O here, um, you know, I, I've got this overlaying the the scan, even kind of comparing it to the Q there. Um, I'd say we're looking quite similar. Um, it also seems like a pretty good grown-up version of the lowercase O as well. So I think I can be pretty happy with that. So uh, with all that said. I'm going to go and unlock this image. Um, I'm actually just going to take that out of the background. Um, and let's take a look at what we've got to kind of round out today's episode. So, um, what do we got? Five, five letters it looks like? Yes. Um, and I'd say on the whole here, as I kind of go back and forth, I think this is a, a fairly decent foundation. Um, Again, as we go, we're going to continually be going back, testing this. Um, once I start having enough letters to, type, uh, to start typing out words in the specimen, um, I'll probably go through and maybe compare that a little bit more. Um, you know, if there's a sentence or two that catches my eye, I can kind of type that out, kind of place them next to each other and, and get a feel if I'm on the right track. Uh, the other benefit of that, of course, is, is taking a look at things like spacing. Uh, I can't say for sure that the specimen I have, if this was done uh, in something like wood or metal type, I loosely presumed that it is. Um, if that is the case, then there probably isn't going to be much in the way of kerning because, um, you know, you, you have two blocks of type kind of bumped up next to each other. There was no Photoshop to, to go and, and move them any closer. Um, when you get into things like photo type, of course, you know, then there was a lot more flexibility there to uh, push letters closer together. But uh, for things like wood or metal type, um, I, I think we might have a, a little bit uh, less to worry about in that department. So at some point I will have to go through and figure out kerning, but all that's to say for the time being, um, I think we're in a good place here. So. Apologies if this one ran a little bit long, but it is exciting to get back into the swing of things. Hopefully you're enjoying this episode. If you have any comments or uh, insights, feel free to drop them below in the comment section. Um, and also while you're at it, make sure to hit that like and subscribe button if you haven't already. Since I am kind of back now and, and starting to put out videos on a more regular basis, if you do have uh, anybody that you know who is interested in this kind of stuff and are looking to dip their toes into type design, feel free to share these videos with them as well. Um, I just wanted to kind of sign off by saying that even with my hiatus over the last year or so, uh, the number of you that have reached out via social media to uh, share your projects that you've been working on uh, after being inspired by the videos that we've, we've produced here has, has been nothing short of an amazing feeling. So um, feel free to continue sending those my way. Uh, I absolutely love seeing that. Um, but with all that said, thanks so much for watching and we'll catch you in the next episode.